James Day, public television pioneer and chairman of the CUNY TV Advisory Board, passed away in April 2008. His legacy includes the series Day at Night, which aired for 130 episodes beginning in 1973. The program features interviews with many of the great thinkers and achievers of the 20th century. These 30-year-old programs have been restored. The interviews remain fresh and relevant today, exploring issues that are still important to society. Showing them again is CUNY TV's tribute to Jim and his contributions to public television. For 19 years, Isidore F. Stone wrote, edited, and published his own four-page newspaper, the I.F. Stone Bi-Weekly. He called it a flea-bite newspaper, or the journalistic equivalent of the old-fashioned Jewish mama and papa grocery store. But when he decided to retire it in 1971, it had built up a national circulation of more than 60,000 subscribers and an influence that went well beyond its size and number of subscribers. It was, like its one-man editorial staff, aggressively independent, liberal to radical in outlook, and relentless in its pursuit of the elusive truth. His colleagues in the Washington Press Corps generally regard Izzy Stone as the best investigative reporter in the business. A number of his pieces in recent years have been collected in the I.F. Stone Reader, only the most recent of his ten or so books. Since retiring the bi-weekly, he's become a contributing editor for the New York Review of Books. Mr. Stone, uh, in the last 19 years with the I.F. Stone bi-weekly, you've had a chance to stand apart from institutions, not be a part of any institution. Why? Well, institutions are very powerful, and uh, those who run them are run by them because the, uh, the circumstances and the, uh, the nature of the institution severely limit the, his decision-making capacity. It's true of every, but men can't live without institutions. Of course. So it's important in a good society to have institutions. You have to have them. It's also important to have <clears throat> independent voices with the freedom to express themselves mm -hmm. who can check the abuses of institutions. What about the men you've dealt with over the years in institutions? Do they behave differently as members of institutions and they might behave as individuals? Are they influenced by the institution? I think inevitably and invariably. Mm -hmm. I mean, no matter how, I mean, think a man like McNamara was a very able man. There were severe limits on what he could do as Secretary of Defense. That's a tremendous organization, the military bureaucracy. And uh, no matter how active, vigilant, vigorous the head of it is, it, very severe limits to what he can do. Mm -hmm. The only way to be free is not to have power. I mean, Diogenes in his tub was free and could afford to tell Alexander to get out of his, to get out of the way while he was taking a sun bath. But you have to, you have to have people with power. Yeah, sure. And you have to have people without power. You have to have uh, bureaucracy. You can't run a complicated society without bureaucracies. And you have to have uh, mechanisms that preserve <clears throat> independence of judgment and expression that will check their abuses and criticize their shortcomings and, and uh, act as a watchdog over them. That's what the press is supposed to be in a free society. Mm. But the press itself becomes institutionalized. Does it have an adversary relationship with, with institutions, with government in this particular case? It has case? to have. If it, if it stops being an adversary, it stops doing, it stops doing its job. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it needs to be perpetually hostile, but basically skeptical, and, and never to allow itself to be drawn into the universe of the, uh, of the men who run the government. Everybody has their own universe, and their own uh, rationale, and their own excuses, and their own uh, adjustment to what they have to do, and most men are most men are honorable and want to do a good job. Uh, you mean they're, 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 the the government 
institutions are not riddled with evil men? No, no. I mean, certainly, uh, I've been in Washington a long time. People don't realize that down in the bowels of the government are a lot of devoted and hardworking people. But, uh, but people are led to do evil in spite of themselves by the nature of the institutions in which they're trapped. Mm -hmm. And have the capacity to rationalize that, I suppose, yeah. for their own... I mean, I, I once uh, had to talk to a group of visiting foreign journalists, and I said, the first thing to remember when you talk to government officials here, don't believe in anything they say. Don't take seriously anything mm -hmm. they say. And they laughed, and I said, I didn't say that for a laugh. I wasn't being cynical. What I mean is that most of what you hear is, is the rationalization of bureaucratic inertia, the momentum of the huge ma machine. Mm -hmm. And to get, ahead, uh, to get ahead in that machine, you have to show you're on the team, as the military say. And therefore, you have to excuse it, to rationalize it, to further its own purposes. And these institutions, which were supposed to be a means, become an end in themselves. You've seen the growth of institutions here in Washington in the years you've been here. Is that going to be inevitable, that it will continue to grow and grow, and institutions will take a, a larger and larger part in our lives? I think so, yeah. <clears throat> I think so, because, uh, because uh, life is becoming more complex, and our problems are becoming more difficult, and uh, it makes it all the more important, however, to, to keep a check on the enormous power uh, in the government. Well, at the same time, those who keep that check, the press in this particular case, is also becoming, I suppose, more institutionalized in the sense that there are fewer and larger newspapers resulting. It's true, uh, but still, uh, institutions, well, they're, they're, at the moment, I've never seen the media as good as they are today. Compared with the 20s, for example, and 30s, far better. Reporting's better, much more independence, as far as the big, uh, the big good papers are concerned. Most papers in this country do a very bad job in the sense that there's very little news in them. And uh, they rarely express an opinion mm -hmm. one way or another. And they're really an adjunct to the advertising pages. Mm -hmm. And the average American in the average small town is very poorly informed. So for a man who ran on one of America's smallest newspapers, you say that quality often is with the largest, not with the smallest even though you yourself ran a, a quite different kind of small newspaper. There's but a, they, yeah, there's the size, the size right. does have some, some right. uh, uh, relationship there, to quality. Then. There's a lot of myth. I started work on a small town daily, a town about 5,000 population. There's a lot of mythology about small town editors and newspapers. In a small town, it's very hard to be independent. People know each other too well, and you can't step on their toes, and there, there's no diversity of advertising. You have to depend upon the the powers that be for legal advertising. A local editor in a small town has much less power than an editor of a big paper in a big city because if he antagonizes one group of advertisers, there's always another one to, to turn to. There's more diversity uh, in the market. And uh, he can afford to express much more independent opinions. And then I've seen some institutions change. I mean, the, the New York Times in the, in the 20s and 30s was really pretty bad. It's, a, it's, a, it's gotten steadily better. It's What's brought about the improvement of these large city newspapers, the large papers? What's that? What's brought about that improvement? Increased professional standards? Well, I think the tradition plays a very useful part in human, li in human life. And uh, the Jeffersonian tradition, the idea of the First Amendment, the duty of the press, the sense of pub public obligation, uh, tends to mold people, just as judges are molded by the law, so newspaper men tend to be molded by the fact that they're in our country. And I think American journalism is superior to that of most countries in the world, in the sense that the journalist in our country has a, has a, uh, a higher and more dignified position in most countries. If you read Balzac, you see what 19th century French journalism was like. And even in England, it, uh, a journalist is looked upon as a hack unless he works for one of the gentlemanly papers. Mm -hmm. Here, because of the First Amendment and the, then Jefferson and the whole spirit of the American government, the press is regarded as really a fourth estate. 
and a sense of duty and responsibility, power and uh, obligation, mold people. And then the, the effect, the, the Vietnam War had some good effects. It, uh, it uh, taught reporters uh, that they could be lied to over and over and over again by the government. And they'd better watch and not just take down the, the words of the, of the Secretary of State or the President as holy writ. They learned a lot of lessons. And then a new generation of youngsters came along with much less uh, stuffiness, much less respect for existing institutions, uh, much less desire to just make a buck, a much more desire for public service, for, uh, much more concern for other human beings. And these youngsters have had a good, a good effect. Look at Time Magazine, how it's, that's improved over what, what it was uh, 15, 20 years ago. So I, I feel the media, the big media and TV are doing a much better job than they did. I, 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 I'm not sure it'll go on. I think that... Uh, why, are you, why aren't you sure? Well, because, uh, you see, this country is partly a democracy and partly a plutocracy. Uh, people have the right to vote, and when they want something, and, uh, get, you know, get off their butt and really ask for it, they get it, it works. When they don't know what they want or don't pay much attention, then mon men with big money buy what they want. And that's the big evil uh, disclosed behind Watergate, is buy the government and buy its policies. Mm -hmm. And the expense of running campaigns uh, makes it necessary to go out and raise an awful lot of money. That's why I'm for public financing of, of campaigns. So. Uh, these uh, big money men tend to buy up newspapers like any other property and run them like a property, that is to make money. A newspaper is not supposed to be, uh, has to make a profit, sure, but it's supposed to be devoted to making money. It's, it has a very mm -hmm. fundamental role to play in a free society and it's a great role protected by the Constitution and uh, and We've had some great publishers who worked that way. We still have some great newspapers like the Times and the Washington Post, the Washington Star, which is different in outlook but equally independent. So I feel very good about the state of the media, except out in the country. When you get out and they travel around the country, you're just cut off from the news. You know what's going on. Mm -hmm. I don't know how people can even even the even the the main TV shows are cut down and in. Uh, and uh, spaces made for local television and local sports and things like that. The, the country, is, in many ways, is very poorly informed for you, such a literate people, such a free society. You began your own journalistic career in a, in a relatively small town, didn't you, in, in New Jersey? Well, I started on a small town weekly while I was going to high school, and then I began to work as country, country correspondent for a small city paper. I've done everything on a paper except said type. Mm -hmm. Didn't you publish your own newspaper, as a matter of fact, when you were I in high school at the age yes, of 14? Yes, I did. At 14, I started a little paper, uh, and it only ran for three issues because I, I, my father discovered I was completely neglecting my schoolwork and made me stop. But you had 500 subscribers or so, didn't you? Well, I had, I had advertising and subscribers and... Uh, An editorial policy? Editorial policy. What I was, was the policy? Well, I was a very strong uh, League of Nations man. I remember writing pieces supporting Gandhi and the cause of Indian freedom. Uh, I was very, very critical of William Randolph Hearst, who at that time was a very demagogic right-wing publisher. Earlier had been different. And uh, the old typesetter said it would spit out tobacco juice and Say I was going to come to a bad end writing all that radical stuff. Those are, yeah, <laughs> those are pretty firm and, and perhaps radical convictions for a youngster of 14. What brought you these convictions at an early age? Well, I think Jack London. Your own, your reading. Then. I think Jack London was the uh, start of my uh, social consciousness. And then... Uh, Any particular books of London that did this? Well, Martin Eden and... Uh, I just remember London as opening my eyes, and, and then all kinds of all kinds of things. Herbert Spencer, and then uh, Kropotkin, and Marx, and uh, Engels, and uh, and Charles Beard, and 
I was a very great, I was a great, re uh, a really book, a real bookworm. You were, what were you, an was eclectic a reader? Yeah. You read everything? Yeah, but I graduated 49th in a class of 52 in a country high school. Uh -huh. Only one boy ranked lower than me because I just stopped doing uh, schoolwork. To, I was doing newspaper work uh, during my sophomore, junior, and senior years and a lot of reading, but I was very rebellious about doing my lessons. Did you come from a family that read a great deal, or was it something you picked up entirely on your own? No, I really picked it up on my own. Mm. Uh, did you have other interests besides reading? It sounds as though you didn't. Well, in a small town with woods, you know, you go out uh, swimming and trapping, and we had a raft, and uh, it was still a very small town where you could you could have just a touch of Tom Sawyer, you know, yeah. or Huckleberry Finn, enough to understand Mark Twain. But books, I think books were, and still are, my passion. Uh -huh. Do you uh, but I feel like Oliver Wendell Holmes had once said with a, with a sigh, I hate to face my maker with a thought of, so many great books on red. <laughs> Do you look back upon it as a, a relatively happy boyhood? Oh, yes. Except it was lonesome in a small town where very few people read books. And uh, to be an intellectual in a small town and a Jewish intellectual in a small Gentile town mm. was, rather, was rather lonesome. There were, nobody really, there were only a couple of people you could talk to about books and about mm. ideas. What about teachers? Apparently not. Well, it, both at school and at college, I had a couple of teachers that I really loved and revered. No other words for it. But most teachers I, I just rebelled against. I didn't think they were very good. Mm -hmm. uh, I rebelled against school altogether, even though I, I, I just, I just uh, rebelled against having things crammed down my throat. Uh, I wrote. You wrote? By, no, by, oh, by, wrote. by wrote. By wrote. I'm sorry, yes. You did go on to the University of Pennsylvania and what studied philosophy, though, but you didn't finish. I majored in philosophy, but I was working on a newspaper and I quit my third year. You were working on a newspaper a good part of the time, I gather. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I waited on the table for a while the first year, and, but uh, most of the time I, uh, I worked on a newspaper. The, the year I quit, I was working about 11 hours a day and night while going to school. And pretty well committed at that point, I suppose, to a career with newspapers. Well, yeah, I was an experienced man by that time. I was making $40 a week while going to school in 1927. That's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And I was doing rewrite and copy desk. Uh, so I was experienced. So you stayed with newspapers then for quite a few years, as a matter of fact, didn't you? Yes. Left I, the small I, town and... Uh, well, I worked on the Camden Courier and the... Uh, Philadelphia Record, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and then the uh, New York Post. I was editorial writer on the Post in the 30s, from 33 to 39. Mm -hmm. And then I went down to Washington, came down to Washington for the nation as Washington editor, which I held for about five or six years. But while, while Washington editor of the nation, I began to work for PM and the successor papers the New York Star and the New York Daily Compass. Mm -hmm. And when the compass closed in uh, 1952, and I couldn't get my job back at the Nation, I decided I would uh, start a four-page uh, newsletter. And what uh, gave you the inspiration to do your own newsletter, to go entirely on your own after all those years with? Well, George Seldes had done it successfully, within fact, mm -hmm. about a decade earlier, and done it very well, and. Uh, I had seen so much money go down the drain, uh, money that wonderful, wealthy people like Marshall Field, for example, who was a very good to us at PM and a wonderful man. Uh, and there you had a wealthy man supporting a nonconformist paper and taking a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, static from his socialite friends yeah. uh, for doing it. He was very good to us. But he lost a tremendous amount of money, and I thought, look, the market's very small. I'll try to fit the product to the market and uh, make it pay for itself by putting it on a very small scale and doing all the work myself. My wife and I did all the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I managed to get 5,300 subscribers to start with, 
and I budgeted that very carefully so I didn't have to run around panhandling uh, to keep going, and I managed. What kind of principles did you did you set for yourself when you built this one-man newspaper? Well, I wanted uh, a radical paper in a conservative format. I wanted uh, dignified topography. I didn't want screaming, sensational headlines. I didn't want exaggeration. I didn't want to pretend I had inside information when I didn't. I wanted it to be sober and factual, uh, as accurate as I could make it, uh, reasoned, not hysterical, so that people on the other side would have to take it seriously, persuasive. And uh, I tried to, to uh, prove what I was uh, saying from the horse's mouth, as it were, using the government's own documents and uh, government reports and uh, transcripts and press conferences and speeches and analyzing them the way, uh, the way a historian would, putting them in perspective, uh, so that a, a, uh, a man on a college campus who took it and showed it to a conservative colleague, he wouldn't just brush it off, he'd have to take it seriously. So you were concerned not just with reaching the converted, so to speak, but you wanted no, to reach I a larger audience. No, people. As a matter secondly, of fact, you had some very distinguished subscribers in that, that uh, early subscription list and later ones too, of course. Well, but I had uh, a lot of undistinguished subscribers yeah. too, which pleased me even more because <laughs> I, I wanted to, uh, to support people that were being harassed and uh, destroyed by the witch hunt. I wanted to defend what I considered uh, uh, basic American principles, and that is the, uh, the right of freedom of speech and p free political activity. And that meant defending uh, first the Trotskyites and then the communists. I disagreed with liberals who were only ready to, pre to, pre uh, to defend people if it could be proven that they uh, were practically illiterate and couldn't possibly be Marxist and uh, they weren't really communists. I, I felt that uh, unless it was freedom for everybody, it would be whittled away for everybody. And that means freedom for half-truths as well as truth? Freedom, freedom for, for lies. For lies. I mean, the, the, the uh, basic premise of a free society is that uh, none of us can be sure of the truth and none of us can uh, ever be sure of the whole truth and therefore it's worth listening to uh, others and uh, unless you're willing to have people tell lies or half lies, you shut off truths. There's no way of policing it. There has to be freedom. There's no halfway house. And that mm -hmm. was the philosophy of, of Jefferson and of the First Amendment. And, uh, and then I wanted to fight for peace and uh, for coexistence. For and coexistence for during a time of Cold War, yeah. you really did not favor the no, Cold War. No, I was against the Cold War. Mm -hmm. uh, I was for Wallace in 1948, and uh, I'm very glad that I was. I realized he had certain mm -hmm. shortcomings, but here's Richard Nixon doing a Richard mm -hmm. what uh, Henry Wallace uh, proposed in 48. Mm -hmm. I think there's a a lot of things wrong in Russia and the Soviet system. And I think that to make a good society there, you're going to have to find some way to, to mesh together the Jeffersonian idea with the socialist mm -hmm. idea. And to me, it's very thrilling to see that when workers revolt, as they did in Hungary in 1956, or in the uh, Baltic cities in Poland, one of the first things they ask for is freedom of the press. People that don't have it, realize its necessity. For me, that's, an, that's a, <clears throat> a demonstration that, uh, that what Jefferson represents, what Milton represents, uh, is a fundamental value and necessity in human life. It's been very important to you to maintain your independence, hasn't it? You've not uh, gone on the usual rounds of uh, inside uh, contacts in Washington. You've kept yourself apart from well, friendships I've, of that sort or I've, apart from... I've, I've you know. always felt that it was dangerous to get too close to people in power. Mm -hmm. And that when you were working on a really good story, the people to trust, the people to go to, were those people down in the bowels of the bureaucracy who were dealing with that specific subject and who were never going to run for public office and had no ax to grind, because you have to be careful. You know, this business of leaks can be, has its very bad as well as a good side. People leak for 
malicious reasons, mm -hmm. for unworthy reasons, for self-serving reasons. A reporter has to be very careful in taking leaks and, and judging the person giving it to you and checking the thing out. Uh, leaks are important, but they're very dangerous, and a responsible journalist has to... You built up a subscription list. I said 60,000 in the beginning. It was, it was over 70,000. A, a, 70, a rather yeah. remarkable subscri <clears throat> subscriber list for a, a publication of this sort. Well, Why was. did you give it up? Well, I, I, it, it just got to be too much for me. It just physically got to be too much. It was an enormous amount of work. I had to change from a weekly to a bi-weekly. And uh, I got began getting angina pectoris, and uh, I just had to stop. I just Aside from the demands of time and so forth, do you miss the voice that you had? Well, every I don't like to look back. I enjoyed that very much. Uh, but I would, I would like to, uh, I would like to learn a little more and work on a, try to understand things better and work on a bigger, on some bigger projects. You've been quoted as saying mm -hmm. that uh, through all the years of your writing, you've been practicing the scales, and now you'd like to give yourself some time and leisure to do something of real value. Have you, do, do you feel that you've not done something of real value in the writing you've <coughs> done over all these years? Well, I guess I guess so, but I'd like to do my very best. And uh, a man never achieves his best. You have to keep striving for it. But I would like to, I would like to write something of value, and, and particularly in the field of freedom of thought and expression, and its importance for a good society. I mean, it's menaced by, it's menaced by uh, the terribly draconian dictatorships of the communist states. And it's menaced by the uh, new, tech, new technologies, the means of surveillance, and uh, the means of, of inculcating conformity in the, in the West. And in our own country, it's menaced by the enormous power of the, of the office of the presidency. Uh, the, the, the president, irrespective of who he is today, is so powerful that uh, the temptations of the office, for good or evil, are too great for any one man. I think the I think we ought to begin to dismantle the office. I think mm. that mm. I think we ought to have a uh, head of state symbolizing the country, <clears throat> and around whom the natural feelings of patriotism and reverence accrue, and separate him from the head of the government. Thank you very much. <laughs> ¶¶